So last week we got started on this topic. And um, as I was considering this week, I realized I should have did this when I had like five or six weeks. Because there is so much stuff wrapped up in this thing. Um, but we're going to go through. Last week we looked at um, why these things are so important. But today we're going to look at strategies. And one of the things that I said last week was, and this is true, there have been more Christian lives derailed as a result of not following these two commands. Renew your mind and guard your heart. You cannot remain steadfast and faithful in the Christian life if you do not adhere to these two commands. Because nothing changes in your life unless your mind changes, unless your heart changes. And we run around putting the car before the horse looking for things to change, but not asking God to change our minds and we're not guarding our hearts and we wonder why things are not changing the way in which we desire them to. So last week we looked at first renew your mind, Romans chapter 12, and we said, strong language, therefore I urge you, Paul is urging the church at Rome and God is urging us to do what follows. He says, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. And then it says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve that God's will is good, pleasing, and perfect will. And basically what it's telling us is, you will be conformed, you will not be able to test God's will, and you will not be transformed unless your mind is renewed. That is the thing that causes all of the other things around it to happen. Then we looked at guarding your heart. Strong language again. My son, pay attention. Proverbs chapter 4. My son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ear to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to one's whole body. And then it says this. Above all else, guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it. And if everything you do flows from it, then it, it just warns us to be able to stand guard on our hearts because if we don't, we will let stuff enter it and then stuff will flow from it, from it that will surprise the life of us. We go, where did that come from? Then we looked at why these areas are so important. Because whatever lives in them determines who you are. We looked at Proverbs 23, uh, Proverbs 23 verse 7 where it says, for as a man thinketh where? In his heart. And we talked about how whatever you ponder most seriously, whatever you consider most deeply, whatever you think on, then gets downloaded into your heart like a computer. And it's always there running in the background. And all we need is life to provide the right keystroke or the right button. And all of a sudden it pops back out. And we go, where did that come from? It came from what you allowed. Right? So as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. Not just as a man thinks, but as he thinks in his heart. Then we say it's because where God looks to determine authenticity. God doesn't just look at your actions to see if you are, you are serious. Because we can do actions and, and not be serious and fool all of us. But God looks in our minds and our hearts. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Jeremiah chapter 17. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind. Even when he's talking about giving rewards, even to give, a, to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. And then we looked at this. So there's a battle waging for your heart and your mind. Because whatever is important to God is important to the enemy. So if your heart and your mind is important to God, it is also important to the enemy. And he wants to have sway over them just like God does so that he can be your God. Then it says, what's the ultimate goal? And the ultimate goal is for our hearts and our minds that will be focused on God. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and your mind. Why would our hearts and our minds be focused on God? So that we would know and demonstrate the heart and the mind of God. And we talked about Samuel. It says that he's raising up a king and it says, I will raise for myself a faithful priest who will do according to what is in my heart, God's heart, and God's mind. Our heart needs to be linked to God's heart so that we can know what is in his heart and his mind and then we can execute plans based on what is in his heart and his mind. Then we looked at what should we do. I'm going to read this very quickly and then we'll get on to our strategies. Philippians chapter 4, rejoice in the Lord always. That's one of the things that we need to do for our hearts and our minds. I will say it again, rejoice. 
Let your gentleness be evident. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious for anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, this is all stuff we need to do, present your request to God. And then look what the next verse says. And the peace of God, which transcends understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds. What we need to do, the stuff that was written before that in order for that to happen. We're running around trying to have peace and not trying to do what he told us in order to have peace. Then it says this right after that. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praise where we think on such things. And I said, what, uh, what our lives would look like if that's what our thoughts look like. But oftentimes, we dwell on so much stuff. We dwell on our past. That's where the enemy wants us to dwell. And God's saying, at some point, shouldn't it not be about what you've done, but where I am taking you? Not about what you've done, but about where you are going. Then it says, again, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts. Now, strategies for renewing our mind and our heart. But before we do that, there are some things that we need to understand. And these things are so important. First thing, with regard to your heart and your mind, your enemy wants you to stop believing one truth so that eventually you forsake all truth. This is important, all right? Because the enemy is fighting on a different level. He is trying to derail everything in your Christian life. And we think he's talking to us about one thing, and he's not. He is trying to derail everything. And you know what's happening in our world today? The enemy places a thought in a Christian's mind and then places something in the heart, maybe about one of, these, one of the movements that's going on. They have, a, they have a, a, a family member or something that's involved in it, and so the heart gets engaged. And it's not about that one thing. You know what these people wind up doing? They wind up throwing everything away. Do you know how many believers, as a result of, of that, something like that, have said to me something like this? I no longer uh, subscribe to evangelical Christianity. I've heard that over and over. And if you say, I no longer subscribe to evangelical Christianity, it means you had no idea what this was about in the first place. It's not about evangelical Christianity. It is about Jesus Christ loving him and following his word. But here's what happened. The enemy put a thought, and then that thought went down to the heart. And then all of a sudden, it's not about that one thing. They're not just questioning that one thing. They're questioning everything. Yeah. The enemy, let me tell you something about your marriage. The enemy wants to make one little thing cause you the whole thing to derail. He wants your, you and your wife or you and your husband to argue over a small thing. And you think it's about that small thing. And the next thing you know, you're walking away from your marriage. It was never about that small thing. It was about the whole thing. And here's the problem. We think it's about that one thing, and so we don't put on the full armor. We think it's talking to us about this one little thing, and so we don't need the full armor, when in reality, he is coming for everything. And that is why, even when we think it's a small thing, we need to engage the armor of God. Job. It was not about what Job lost. You know what, the, what, what Satan's girl was? Satan told God, Job is going to curse you to your face. That's what it was about. It was not about the first thing he lost, or the second thing, or the sickness. It was about getting him to curse God to his face. And so the enemy comes to you and places one thought, and you think it's about this one thought. But he is after derailing your whole Christian life. He don't care about this one thought. He cares about you living and honoring God. And that's what it's all, always been about. And so when you stand against him, you stand, you, you, you do it, we, we always do it, we do it kind of flippantly or, or nonchalantly because we just think it's about this one thing. And it's coming for the whole thing. We've got to understand this. He makes you think it's about one issue, but it's about the whole thing. Look at this. Do you know when Satan was talking to Eve, it was never about a tree or a fruit? A tree or a fruit was what they were talking about. But Satan was trying to derail the whole thing. 
Eve was talking to him about trees and fruit. And he was talking to her about, I'm going to mess up this entire thing. So Eve is like, um, no, the serpent was more crafty than any of um, the wild animals. And the Lord God made, that the Lord God made, he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? This had nothing to do with trees. This had nothing to do with fruit. This had wanted, this is Satan wanting Adam and Eve to replace God with him or with themselves, where they become God. So when he comes to you and he, you hear him talking about a tree or a fruit, it is not about that. It's about the whole thing. And unless you take it seriously, be it about the whole thing, you will probably wind up one day down the road saying, I no longer subscribe to evangelical Christian, Christianity. And, you, and then you're wondering about the whole thought process. Think about the thought, whole thought process that gets two people who are in perfect communion with God in a perfect setting who had everything they wanted, everything they needed, didn't have one need, one want, Satan plays one thought, and then later on in that same chapter, God is roaming in the garden, he, and, and, and he, uh, um, Adam answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Two people in perfect communion with God, now hiding. And it started with trees and fruit. Whole thing derailed. Understand that Satan is not just about the things that you think is about. He's about the entire thing. Second thing, being serious about this is a prerequisite for helping us, for us helping others in this area. Us being serious about renewing our heart and transforming our, and, and guarding, I'm sorry, guarding our heart and renewing our mind is a prerequisite to helping other people. I, I, I often hear people say, you know what, I need to protect my children. Protect yourself first. I, I want my child's mind and heart to be right. Well, you know what you can do? Yeah. First, consider yours. With regard to renewing your heart and your mind, you know what it's like? It's like when the oxygen mask drop on a plane. You know what they tell you? Put yours on first. Because if you don't, you might be, you might be running unconscious and unable to help the person next to you. If you're going to help them first, you may, you may fall unconscious and then you can't help yourself or them. So, I want you to be concerned about your, your children's heart and mind. But before that, I want you to be concerned about yours. Because if, it's, if, you, if you're not, you will be telling your children, do what I say and not as I do. And you know how confusing that is to them? So, second thing, you've got to be serious uh, about this first before you start helping other people concerning this. And here's what the Bible says. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, now, when we read this, we, we go straight to the action of the sin, okay? But in order for us to sin, stuff has to happen in our minds and our hearts first. So even though you don't read it there, it's there, okay? So basically, if someone is caught in a sin um, uh, who live by the Spirit, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently, but watch yourself your heart and your mind, or you also may be tempted. It's saying, take care of your heart and your mind, and then you become useful to other people. Now, one of the things that I asked you last week was to think about strategies that you use to guard your heart and your mind. Number one, serve. Do you know how much serving helps your mind and your heart to be aligned with God's mind and heart. It is unbelievable. When you are given to service, when you are given to thinking about meeting the needs of others, when you are thinking about, about um, uh, uh, sure, well, getting the gospel out there, something happens in your mind and your heart that takes it away from all of, all of your mess and it places it somewhere else. This is what the Bible says, set your mind on these things. It is incredible. Now listen, next year, uh, the elders in, in one of the meetings are already started talking about the, the need for this church to be able to impact the community. We've got to be in the community, right? 
They have, how will they, how will they not know? I mean, how will they know that Jesus loves them if we are not there? Okay, so, so we, we started talking about this. The flourishing aid is already uh, have, are, um, having a ministry to the people at uh, Dame Marjorie Bean. I used to go there on Fridays. These, these are, um, you know, children who have physical and mental handicaps. So they've already started having an impact on them. And, uh, and also they want to have an impact with the, stu with the teachers. Right? This is, this is during COVID. But imagine... Now, later on, they, the florist and ladies just walk, and they, have, they had a tea for them one time. But imagine they have all of, the, all of the parents there, and they say, how can we help? And then they endeavor to help them. They, they, they say to the, um, the teachers, how can we help? And we help them out practically. I promise you, as you serve, there will be opportunities for the gospel to be shared. People will be getting saved. That's why, before we start doing this, one of the things that we're considering is, is, is uh, teaching discipleship because we need an army of disciples when these people start coming in here. Right? Serve. I'm telling you, service has, some, has so much impact on your mind and your heart. Do you know too much too much of my mind and my heart is spent on me and my issues. You know what happens when your mind and your heart is spent on somebody else and somebody's issues? It, it, it's amazing. And, and oftentimes our minds and our hearts aren't changing because we aren't engaged in service. Here's what the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2. Therefore, if you have any encouragement being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any... Uh, tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in mind and one in, one in spirit and one in mind. And then the next verses say this, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility value others above yourselves, do not looking to your own interest, but to the, but each of you to the interest of others. Do you know what that does to your heart and your mind, but do you also see what it does in making us all united? It speaks about us being like-minded. And, and, and when we all come together to serve, and it's something now that, 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 not just something we do, it's who we are. You know what I mean? It's not just, oh, um, Christmas store, or and, 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 these things are wonderful, but it's not just Christmas store, it's not just this every three months, but now we've gotten to the point where all of our mindsets us are just, I, I want to serve. And so we don't need an event. We just serve. And then you know how, how that makes us like-minded? you know how that changes our minds? Do you know how that bonds us together? Secondly, Sarjani was talking about this. We've got to get to a point where we acknowledge that there is a war for our mind and our hearts. We walk around thinking that there is no war. And if you think there is no war, you are not dressed for battle. And so when he comes to fight, you're not prepared. There is. Let me, let me tell you something about your, your mind and your heart. Satan is so interested in your mind and your heart. Because your mind and your heart are the most significant things with regard to diminishing his kingdom. When your mind and your heart is right and you start serving and you're sharing the gospel, you are a threat to his kingdom. So he is really interested in battling you with regard to your mind and your heart so that you would be an agent and think about this. See, when I'm about to say this, you, you think, no, not me, never. But it's so that you would be an agent for his kingdom. And you don't have to be an agent for his kingdom going around saying, worship Satan. All you have to do is, be, you know what? I don't, I don't take this Christian thing serious. This, this thing, by, this thing, no, no. You say stuff like that, then you become an agent for his kingdom. Look what it says. 2 Corinthians 4. Though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. And we'll stop there because we're going to read the rest of this later. But the first thing it tells us is we are waging war as we live in the world. And so when you wage war, there's a posture you take, right? And, and the posture you take is important because it allows you to get where you need to go. In tennis, you see them standing like this when they're waiting for a serve. You know why the racket is here? Because they can get here to the back here and here. 
They wouldn't have it all the way here because if they serve beforehand, they've got to do this. In sprinting, I'm not going down there, but <laughs> they go in blocks now, right? Remember, we used to start like this. Can I tell you, if you start like this and not in that posture, by 10 meters, you'll be way behind because this is not an effective starting posture. It was back then when everybody did it, but now that we have this new posture, right? You have to be in a posture that says, no, here's the thing. You think, oh, well, Pastor Evans, that makes life, life oh, it's so boring. And no, 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 no. If you're serious about the Lord, the only way you can have fun in your Christian life is to be in the right posture. Because if not, you're going to be in sin. And if you are in sin, then your life's not going to be fun at all. You're going to be like, oh, woe is me, look at me, right? When you are in the right posture, you can actually enjoy your life, Right? We are, and I used this analogy a long time ago, but we are, we are on a battleship, but with a cruise ship mentality. The war's going on, and we're at the buffet. Right? The enemy's coming at us, and, and we're, we're eating food and getting all fat and in the disco and doing all that stuff. Cruise ship mentality when we're being attacked. Can you imagine guys on a battleship at the buffet when they're surrounded by the enemy? And then the thing goes off, woo, 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 time for war. And I'm like, oh, my word, I I can't even stand up. I just finished eating like the midnight buffet. But it's funny, but it's, 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 this is how we live. We've got to understand that there is a war. And we need to take up the posture that says that. Secondly, we've got to acknowledge where the war war is fought. It says at the bottom, we, we demolish arguments, every pretension that sets us up against the knowledge, this is talking about our minds of God, and then we take every thought captive to make it obedient to Christ. Stop trying to change your behavior as an act of will and do what is necessary to renew your minds and guard your hearts. We're running around going, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to do this anymore. And because we're just thinking about the one thing that we're not supposed to do, we wind up doing it. God says, do what is necessary to renew your hearts and your minds. Right? You renew your mind, you guard your heart, and then your behavior follows naturally. Right? So, it is not primarily about your behavior. It is primarily about your mind and your heart. And what God says is, and this is such an important instruction, you take every thought captive. Lock it up. Put it in jail. Take the ones that aren't consistent with God and lock it up so that it does not have an impression on your heart. Because once it has an impression on your heart, it will always be running in the background. Take it and put it where it deserves and then set your minds on things above. Set your minds. That's an action you take. Next, we must pick up our weapons and realize their power. Four, then it says, look, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. I don't punch, I don't kick. I don't shoot. I don't stab. On the contrary, they have all of those things I just used. They only have human power. The ones that we use have divine power to demolish strongholds. Right? Praise, worship, prayer, thanksgiving, rejoicing, service. Pick up the weapons. Understand the power power that they have to demolish strongholds in your life. Because that's what we need. Strongholds demolished. A call to action. A call to action. Stop looking for God to do something. That sounds terrible, right? But look what it says afterwards. Do what he's instructed and then inspect him to do something. You see the different mindset? Right? Lord, please renew my mind. And God's saying, go do what I told you and watch what I do. See, we want God to renew our minds and we want our hearts guarded, but we don't want to participate. 
In order for the sea to be parted, Moses had to put the stick in the water. Because God wanted him to be to participate. In order for the walls to fall, Israel had to march around and shout. Now, did God need them to do that for walls to fall? No. But that was for their benefit. They participated in the miracle. In order for the Jordan to part, the priest had to step in the water. God is saying, you are coming to me expecting a miracle. I'm telling you, do what you need to do and watch me do a miracle in your life. A call to action. A call to action for us to understand what weapons we've been given. Pick them up and then watch God do incredible things. We're going to pray. If you want to respond to this call to action, stand up right now and we're just going to pray. And we'll pick up this topic sometime next year because there's so much more to be taught on this thing. First of all, you spend a few minutes praying and then I'll close in prayer. sometimes I read the Bible and I see some of the things that people done. I see the miracles that you do and I wonder where are they? Because I know you haven't changed. Father, help us to understand that there is a need for us to do what you have called us to do so our minds can be renewed. God, help us to understand that this is not even just about us. Our minds being renewed and our hearts being guarded, it's about other people who need to be, need to hear about you as well. It's about your gospel permeating this country and beyond. It's about so much more than us, Lord. But God, often when the enemy comes, to attack our hearts and our minds. We think it's just about us and just about this one thing that he's talking about. Lord, help us to understand that he wants us because he also wants other people. But the same reason, God, you want us also so you can influence and impact and save other people. So today, God, I pray that we would take this thing seriously concerning our hearts and our minds and that we would do what is necessary to renew our hearts I mean, renew our minds and to guard our hearts. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's praise God and thank you for what he's done. Let's go and do what is necessary for our minds to be renewed and to guard our hearts. God bless you.